Hello, and thanks for joining today. My name is Ben Bode, and I've been with the Pratt Miller Aerodynamics Department since 2011. I led the aero development on the C8R and the brand new Z06 GT3R. And we're here to talk to you today about our aero development process. It was born in racing, but it can be applied to any road vehicle. Hi, I'm the other Ben, Ben Brady. I'm a technical fellow in the aerodynamics group. I've been with Pratt Miller for 20 plus years, uh, working on motorsport, automotive, commercial trucking, and various other R&D projects. So during the webinar today, we'll be taking questions. So if you have any of those, please put them in the chat and then we will answer those when we get to the end. Thanks for being with us today. Pratt Miller is a product development company with a long history in motorsports and non-motorsport ground vehicle development. Our aerodynamic synthesis process has grown organically over many years through our need to compete at, in high level motorsports. What we're seeing recently is that with the emphasis on alternate energy sources for propulsion and the need to achieve um, reasonable range targets, our customers are finding that they need to be more rigorous, find smaller and smaller aerodynamic gains, and that's where we feel like our process really shines. So what do we mean when we say aerosynthesis? It's not just about optimizing downforce versus drag, but how do we improve the total vehicle package with aerodynamic development? That means understanding cross-system trade-offs. It means leveraging all the virtual and empirical tools that we have and scaling those to meet the customer needs. It all starts with target setting, and this is arguably the most important part of the process. Before any design starts, we use our simulation tools to understand performance sensitivities and cross-system trade-offs. We use that to decide our targets and metrics for tracking those targets up front before we get to the wind tunnel or do any CFD development. This allows our decision making during the development phase to be as objective and as efficient as possible. Yeah, I agree, Ben. I think this is one of the most important aspects of things, uh, really sets the foundation. So with every customer, uh, you know, it's unique what they're trying to achieve. So we try to make sure that we spend a lot of time digging very deep on what they're looking for, what we're actually trying to, uh, you know, what our goals are and not, and not just be ambiguous about it. So for example, um, some customer might have a specific drive cycle or race event that's more important than another, or maybe you know the overall championship is most important, or you know hitting the EPA number, or maybe it's some combination that we need to weigh uh, and, and define the importance. So we want to make sure that's really clear. There's other things, you know, styling, packaging, drivability, stability, all these aspects of a vehicle that we need to account for that the aerodynamics uh, are important for. So try to make sure we define all that. Then. For every application, there are cross-system trade-offs. There are um, sensitivities between the changes we make in, in other parts of the vehicle and even between different aspects of the aerodynamics. So we need to make sure that we um, define those and then we equate those into a common denominator strategy. So um, often if you know the thing that we're most uh, interested in is something like range or lap time, we try to talk in those terms for these different aspects of the vehicle and even for non-vehicle aspects. So, if we are changing the aerodynamics, but we're adding parts, we're adding mass, you know, what's the mass impact of that as well, not just the aerodynamic impact. And then another uh, you know, really common example for aerodynamic trade-off that we have to look at is when we're changing the exterior shape, um, you know, we often impact the cooling of the vehicle. And we often have a heat rejection target that we need to hit. And if we make changes and we think we found a bunch of performance and then we find we're not meeting our heat rejection target, we didn't really find real performance because we can't use it because we can't just have the car go out and drive and, and have the powertrain melt down. So um, it's really important for us to uh, determine uh, what is real performance. So Pratt & Miller's developed methodologies where we can virtually adjust our aero uh, performance to account for these different cross-system trade-offs and have confidence that when we're comparing things and reporting our achievements, they're real. I think you listed several very important points about the target setting, and if those targets were to be set separately, the total vehicle solution wouldn't be as good. Such an important part of our target setting is considering the, the total vehicle solution with all of those different trade-offs so we're making the best vehicle possible. After target setting, the next step in our process is something we call the arrow of the concepts. So this is where we try to come up with creative solutions, really big changes rather than doing detailed optimization. We're trying to do this to make sure that we explore all the potential performance um, that we can find and not worry about production feasibility and let that limit us. CFD is our tool of choice for evaluating these early concept ideas. 
Like Ben said, it allows us to test big changes early in the program and understand impacts on the flow field. We use this to narrow down key areas to focus on based on the targets that we set. In the example image, one of the first things that we studied on the C8R development was the cooling architecture. Before we had anything designed in the car, before we had even designed a roll cage or any chassis structure, we evaluated this in CFD because at that point we weren't committed to any major designs. The goal was to understand the trade-off of sending the radiator exit flow over the center of the car like we did on C7 versus splitting around the side and even exiting out the door to protect the rear wing. We were able to find an efficiency gain by doing this, and you can see in the center image on this slide, the final configuration we came with was a hybrid of options one and two in the images on the right. So this is a great example of the trade-offs of downforce and drag aero efficiency versus thermal performance and making sure we hit both of those targets. So CFD allows us to clearly visualize the flow field and understand complex interactions early in the program. We feed our CFD tools with parametric CAD models. We call these aero surface generators. They're parametric so we can quickly adjust the shape and develop many options in a short amount of time. Those generators are linked and traceable throughout our entire process. So if a concept works well in CFD, we can further evolve that generator to make parts for the wind tunnel and test later in the process. Another very important part that we consider early in the program is the styling. Ultimately, styling sells cars. It's important, and we don't hide from that. We prefer to be proactive rather than reactive when it comes to styling. This means collaborating with customer styling departments. Instead of reporting how bad a shape is, we like to answer the question, how good could it be? The next step in our process is high throughput wind tunnel testing, which is really our workhorse tool for finding performance gains. So we don't just look at absolute values of drag and lift. Uh, what we find is we really want to dig into what are the trends. Uh, we try to use instrumentation to look at uh, the, the pressure distribution in the flow fields um, and really try to build confidence in our tool chain and compare that data to CFD and then our other higher fidelity wind tunnel testing later on. Um, with every program, we spend time in that correlation because without it, we really don't have that confidence. So another really important aspect of wind tunnel testing is that we're trying to develop where the full operating range. So we're trying to account for all the different attitudes and situations the vehicle will experience so that we can make sure that we're optimizing over what it's actually gonna see through its uh, duty cycle. And then another aspect that we, uh, that's really important for us in wind tunnel testing is repeatability. So, <clears throat> Um, we spend a lot of time making sure that our models are very repeatable because if we can't repeat that change, we don't have confidence that the result that we're getting is just from random chance or if it's actually from, from the thing that we did. So that's a really cornerstone aspect of something that we focus on. So um, one aspect in wind tunnel testing that we can look at that is kind of new is looking at things like real world drag. So often for automotive, um, they're looking at very simplistic aspects of uh, the drag of the vehicle. But we really try to dig in deeper to, you know, what is it doing in traffic? What is it doing in, in crosswind situations to account for all those things that it's actually going to see in, in the real world? So we often get the question of CFD versus wind tunnel. And our answer is, they're a knife and a fork. You need both. In the example image on the top right on the slide, <clears throat> it's trying to show that CFD is great for concepts and flow field visualization. In CFD, you can scan through the entire computer model in the 3D space and see all of the flow detail. So we love that visualization for understanding the interactions in the flow. However, the wind tunnel is great for high throughput and doing aero maps where we change the vehicle attitude and get ride trend visualization. So it's a different type of visualization, and those are the two um, contour maps that you see on the image in the center. Those are equally important. We want to understand all the aspects of the flow field so that we can understand the geometry interactions, but we also want to understand how that flow is changing as the vehicle changes ride height. That's important for a race car as it goes from braking to mid-corner to the acceleration zones, but it's also important for road vehicles that see crosswind and other, other attitude changes. This is why the reduced scale wind tunnel is, is, like Ben said, our primary development workhorse. It's our highest throughput for fast iterations. We like to use it early in the program when there's still time for large architectural design changes. By the time full-scale test properties exist, often many critical decisions have already been made and it's too difficult to make those changes. 
on scale model, the body is rapid prototype, so we can make almost any change that we can come up with. We bring hundreds of uniquely designed wind tunnel parts to work through each test matrix on each area of the car. That requires a pit stop mentality for making part changes, because the more runs that we can fit into a wind tunnel test, the more performance we can find. So every single change, we're making, cha making changes on the car just like we would at Daytona. Full-scale wind tunnel is also an extremely important part of our process. We use that for refinement and final decisions. Usually at that point, many of the main program decisions have already been committed. So we're into the final tweaks to optimize the performance. That's also our highest accuracy, but most expensive tool. Depending on the scope, and the program design maturity, it's possible to do development work in full scale, but it's a lot more efficient if we can use that scale model tool beforehand. In order to feed those wind tunnel tests with hundreds of parts to explore all the different test matrices, we use parametric part design like we mentioned in the CFD process. If a concept is good in CFD, we'll further evolve that part generator into a generator that can develop actual physical wind tunnel test parts. This is, allows us to quickly design hundreds of unique designs that can quickly and accurately be bolted to the car. We spend a lot of time making the initial CAD model so that we can spend minimal time outputting many parametric iterations. Then once we're actually testing, how do we decompose all of that data we're collecting? We have data reduction tools for processing large amounts of data and reducing that to the key target metrics that we're tracking throughout the entire process. This creates a database of information over time that also informs future decisions on future programs. So after we've found a, a ton of performance in the wind tunnel, often the next step is to do some driver, uh, some drive simulations. So that can involve um, things like computer simulations to go back and look at those trade-offs that we looked at before in the target setting process and really confirm our performance sensitivities and make sure that we're still on the right track um, after our baseline shifted um, considerably. That also might involve driver in the loops uh, simulator where a real person is driving a model of the vehicle and we're looking at you know dynamic characteristics, um, things like pitch, you know, pitch sensitivity, yaw sensitivity that you really can only do with a real human. Um, this uh, driver, driver in the loop simulator step is typically more geared towards performance applications where um, you know, different race car drivers have different abilities and different um, responses to different things. So you're really trying to determine what the best trade-off is there. Um, it's not often used this way, but I think it's really overlooked in, as a tool where you can um, use driver in the loop simulator to also develop control strategies for electronic systems like active aerodynamics. And more and more we're seeing that um, you know, those are aspects in scope for production vehicles that are becoming more and more important to achieve the aggressive aero requirements that are needed. So these virtual drive simulations are used in our initial target setting phase, but as Ben mentioned, we revisit that as soon as we have data from the first wind tunnel test. We use our multi-dimensional aero maps to feed that to whichever tool we use for the drive simulation and track our progress relative to our targets. We might even adjust our targets if it makes sense based on the data that we've learned as we progress. We have multiple tools available to us, and again, it's about using the right tool for the job. So those tools can uh, vary on a range between drive cycle simulation, which is for simple vehicle modeling and evaluating high-level cross-system trade-offs. We can take that to the next step of what we call lap time simulation, which is a Pratt Miller internal software where we can have an entire physics model of the car and send that to a batch solver which, which can run multiple laps much faster than real time. This allows for large DOEs to characterize more complex performance sensitivities. Finally, we can take things to the driver and loop simulator. <clears throat> High downforce cars will end up with a driving feel that tends to be dominated by the aerodynamic characteristics. In this case, we need a driver to get the subjective feedback to help guide the shape of the aero map that we're optimizing in the wind tunnel. Yeah, and another aspect I was just thinking about that, um, you know, it typically doesn't fall under the aerodynamics group, but all these simulations, we don't just limit them to aerodynamics. So in that same, at that same time that we're looking at um, redoing simulations to look at our targets, we want to look at things like uh, mass and center of gravity and all these different aspects of the vehicle that can impact 
uh, either high performance or range, things like that. And even things like tuning the you know, throttle response for an electric vehicle, um, you know, that may have just as important uh, uh, you know, difference on the performance of something like range as reducing drag. So we really want to make sure that all of our tools are used broadly to find the overall performance of the vehicle and don't just focus on uh, aerodynamics when there could be other lower hanging fruit available. I think it's a great point you brought up. As much as we live for finding downforce, if it makes the car faster to take an aerodynamic loss, but improve the ram air effect of the engine intake, then that's the option that we choose to make a better vehicle package. Our next phase in the process is final refinement and mapping. At this point, it's important to have high fidelity, high accuracy data. So generally, our tool of choice is full-scale rolling road wind tunnels. Usually at this point in the program, it's difficult to make large architectural design changes. So we choose key areas where we want to finalize the design in full scale based on what we've learned in CFD and scale model up until this point. Then we go through final aero mapping and multiple vehicle attitudes combined with multiple part configurations on the vehicle. And one benefit with full scale uh, testing is that once we have an actual vehicle, a prototype vehicle, we can account for all the panel gaps and the deflections and all these production content that are more difficult to do in scale model or wouldn't be efficient to do in scale model. Um, as Ben mentioned, we often save some key aspects to refine and optimize in full scale. Um, through our you know, years and years of experience and doing different types of testing and just our understanding of the flow of physics, we know that because of you know, Reynolds equivalency and different um, aspects of the flow um, phenomena, there are certain areas where we can have higher or less confidence in that um, scale model environment. So by saving those uh, you know, really sensitive parts typically for full scale, it really allows us to you know, make sure that we have confidence in the final results and, and uh, get the best overall vehicle performance. The, um, you know, as Ben mentioned, you know, mapping is a really important aspect of this and um, often as we're looking at these different vehicle configurations, I think I mentioned it before, but active aerodynamics are becoming you know, more common. Um, we really want to account for those. And full-scale testing at speed you know, that the vehicle will actually see allows us to do that when it's um, you know, with the full loads and moments that the um, components are actually going to see. And that always has a big impact on the control strategy and really something that needs to be accounted for. And, Regardless of the vehicle, you know, safety is often a concern. Um, we want to make sure that uh, when a, a real human, you know, puts their life at risk going out on a closed circuit, that we understand what the vehicle is going to do. And full-scale testing allows us to make sure that we understand that and can adjust and tune the vehicle to make sure it's safe that first time out. Validation is the last step in the process where we take a functional vehicle out to a closed circuit course or racetrack and confirm that the performance is what we expect. We run a variety of instrumentation to measure the aerodynamic characteristics, the heat rejection, and also the environmental conditions of the vehicles seen at the time. Real world testing is very noisy, so at Pratt & Miller we've developed a variety of tools that help us take all the you know, many uh, millions of data points and really bake that down into uh, metrics that we can use to make actionable, de actionable decisions. All those measurements are becoming really important um, more and more these days because as we're relying more and more on computer simulations, we really need to validate that and build confidence over time. And with every test, we get that data, we compare to what we expect. It allows us to gradually improve our simulation tools so we have um, you know, better and better uh, features and correlation for the next time. As Ben said, in this final validation process, we like to be self-critical. This means asking ourselves, not only did we achieve our targets, but did our tools guide us correctly? And how can we improve our tools in the future? What could be better on the next generation vehicle based on what we learned? So this, this process is, is really important to us, and part of the reason that this is a cycle. This plugs right back into target setting in the next phase. We correlate our expected aero data using instrumentation. And a few of those examples would be on-body pressure taps, off-body keel arrays, thermal system instrumentation for measuring heat rejection in a real-world situation, and force transducers. 
We use that to, con to continuously improve our CFD and wind tunnel tools to search for continuous improvement. We also compare our virtual drive simulations to the real world results to see if those can be fine tuned and made better in the future. Another important thing that we like to do if the scope allows is intentionally changing aero devices on a real vehicle. This allows us to make sure that the changes that we expect in the virtual world add up to a perceivable change in the real world. And that very important driving characteristic that we talked about is actually perceivable to a real human driver. Yeah, and I think that's a big advancement from where we were you know, a decade ago to be able to really have those predictive tools to where now we're getting really good correlation the first time out uh, and really building that confidence uh, more and more. Absolutely. So now that we've talked through our aero process in general terms, we'd like you to take you through two specific examples. Um, the first case study is the C8R development. So we've got that same aero development wheel in the center of this with several images showing the evolution of the C8R. We started development of the C8R in 2016, and this all started virtually. Before we designed a single part, before we did a single CFD run, we started virtually an LTS, lap time simulation, as well as the driver and loop simulator. One of the interesting things that you can do with these virtual tools is you can feed it fictional aero maps. So we started with an aero map of C7R, and then we manipulated the shape of that aero map to come up with fictitious changes to understand how we wanted to change the shape of the map ideally on the new car. So you can see that in the center image during the target setting phase. We sent professional drivers to the driver and loop simulator and tested several different shapes of that aero map to understand the range of pitch sensitivity that we wanted to target on the car. Next, we got into CFD development. This is where we made large concept changes and understood the performance potential we had with the new bin engine architecture. <clears throat> One of the things that we tested very early on was the cooling architecture, where we decided if we wanted the radiator wake to go over the center of the greenhouse and flow under the rear wing versus split along the side of the car. This not only had cooling impact, it also changed the balance of the vehicle. So something that we needed to understand very early before we made large packaging changes. Once we had key areas that we wanted to focus on based on our initial CFD studies, we progressed into scale model wind tunnel testing. You can see that image on the bottom right in this cycle. We built the scale model wind tunnel and brought hundreds of parts to each test to have parameterized studies to break down and optimize different areas of the car. One of the major focuses during this phase of the project was the front underwing, which has the key characteristic of front downforce versus front ride height. This has a major impact to the driving feel of the car. One funny anecdote from the first wind tunnel test, as we were in the wind tunnel, we sent the first aero map to the team that was on the driver and loop simulator with Antonio Garcia, longtime Corvette racing driver. The response I got was an email with no subject and no body, just an audio recording. And it was Antonio saying, if this is the new car, we will never win. <laughs> it was our first wind tunnel test early concepts, we had a long way to go, but it was motivation for the team to keep working and hone in on that pitch sensitivity target. An important part of that program was every wind tunnel test, we would update those aero maps, send them to the dill, have the drivers try them, and, and continue to refine our targets to optimize that pitch sensitivity. Of course, as we got further and further, we developed aero maps that Antonio was happy with, and we were able to progress into full scale. Full scale, again, like we talked about earlier, this is where we do the final component refinement when a lot of the car has been locked down. So by this time on C8R, all of the top body work had been fixed because we had finalized the molds. But we knew from scale model testing just how sensitive that front underwing profile and detail shape refinement was. So we intentionally made that part modular on the full scale car. We narrowed down options from CFD and scale model wind tunnel and brought a handful of options to full scale where we could finalize that driving feel and that front ride height versus front downforce trend. At each step in the process, we're sending that data back to the driver and loop simulator and back to LTS to see how we're tracking on our targets. At the very beginning of the program, we had developed a range of min and maximum pitch sensitivity and we're able to achieve that range with the data that we got in the full scale wind tunnel. The final part of that process was validating that on track, and I think this was one of the most rewarding parts of the process. After the, the full-scale wind tunnel testing, 
we chose a handful of parts that we then wanted to progress to track testing. We had all of our drivers ch try each one of the parts, and we, all the drivers unanimously agreed on the final configuration. One of the really interesting aspects of that was we actually took a s very small aero efficiency loss to make the drivers happier with the driving characteristic of the car. Now, why would we do that? Well, in racing, especially endurance racing like this, the drivers have to do 24-hour races where they're changing drivers through the middle of the night, sometimes double and triple stinting the car. It's just as important that you can do continuous fast laps as it is one single qualifying lap. So this is why it made sense to prioritize the driving characteristics of the car with something that the drivers are actually happy with. I think one really interesting point of that is the final pitch sensitivity that we ended up with was right in the middle of the target range that we had defi defined two years prior, giving us more confidence in this process going forward. So that fed right into the new development of the new GT3 car. That's great. I, I can remember um, being in the control room at Windshear uh, before we had this process, before we were doing DIL testing and we were tracking pitch sensitivity and no one knew <laughs> what we really wanted and we were arguing about what we should do and these trade-offs that, that you had to wrestle with. And um, we really just took our best guess at the time. We didn't have objective tools to make that decision. And I think it's great now that we really have a process where you, you know, where we've built confidence that what we're doing is the right decision. Yeah, and without these virtual tools, we'd be flying blind. I think that's such an important part of our process is that target setting and using the virtual tools to confirm our targets. If not for that, it would just be opinioneering in the control room at the wind tunnel. And by using these tools, we can have a, a lot higher confidence that we're doing the right thing, and we can make quick, efficient decisions in the wind tunnel so that we can optimize as fast as possible. Yeah, absolutely, because just as much as making the right decision is making the decision quickly in the wind tunnel where time is money and performance. And if you're spending downtime arguing about what's better or worse, then you're not putting the next change on and finding you know performance. So I think it's, it's really great. Absolutely. Yeah, we prefer to do all the arguing ahead of the wind tunnel test so the decisions are fast during the wind tunnel test. So the next case study we want to talk about is a battery electric vehicle application. At Pratt Miller, we do um, a lot of confidential work for customers, and obviously we can't show you that. So we want to just walk you through um, a theoretical uh, situation of, of how our process will be applied to that application. So, uh, you know, obviously uh, the requirements and the, the goals for uh, a battery electric vehicle for an on-road application will be a lot different than a motor spray application, but the process is still very similar. We want to go through kind of the different twists of, of how we would approach that. So this is a, you know, a concept that, that uh, we came up with um, that uh, I'm assuming visibility is not a priority for this customer. Uh, the sight lines don't look great. Uh, maybe it's an autonomous minivan. Um, something like that. But um, for this situation, uh, you know, we still want to go through those target settings and really define what's important. So for this, even though downforce uh, isn't going to be critical, long, you know, high speed range is going to be really important, but we also need to keep the powertrain cool and the all the electronics cool, um, things like that. Um, so we're still going to walk through and do uh, drive cycle simulations um, of the vehicle so that we can quantify the aerodynamic trade-offs um, for those different things. But also for this, even more so, look at things like mass, battery capacity, tire rolling resistance, make sure that we run those simulations and determine their sensitivity to the targets, in this case, range, and make sure that we can then decide if there's a trade-off between aerodynamics and battery capacity, we know what that is and can make an informed decision, a data-driven decision. The next step, uh, you know, similar would be looking at aero concepts in CFD, working closely with the styling studio. We're really looking at, you know, really big variations, um, architectural changes uh, of what, you know, what we could find, what we what we want to do to achieve um, our goals. So, for example, we've got a kind of a weird duct here um, uh, concept in this vehicle. So maybe we look at some different devices like that. Um, you know, things like air curtains and these different things that might be um, aerodynamic devices to kind of work with different styling aspects that, that are uh, important. 
So once we get the general vision uh, decided upon, we move on to wind tunnel testing, uh, very similar where we look at a high throughput wind tunnel testing environment. So that would typically be scale model, low cost parts we can make a lot of and really make uh, you know, many changes in a given day or week to find a lot of performance. One thing, Ben, we didn't really talk about before was just that throughput aspect um, compared to CFD where a lot of people think CFD is really fast, and it can be, but there's often a lot of trade-off with uh, running CFD quickly and actually getting an accurate result that you can trust. Um, with scale wind tunnel modeling uh, testing, you really can get a lot of changes quickly, you know, whereas in CFD it might take hours or even days to get a result uh, for a very brief, real, you know, time of flow physics. In the wind tunnel, you can get, you know, hundreds of runs in a day, um, you know, in, in that amount of time. It requires investment up front, but once you actually get there, the throughput is very quick and you can find a lot of performance uh, very fast. Once we uh, go through all those iterations, find performance, um, we would still um, try to feed that back into our computer simulations and revisit things. For example, let's say on this vehicle we have some active aerodynamic devices and we want to confirm that they're actually worth it. Often the costs of those are going to be high. Um, you probably don't want to just put them on uh, and not really know what that cost benefit um, is. So we can go back, look at those simulations, look at the active aerodynamic devices um, throughout the operating range of the vehicle and confirm that the performance actually meets the trade-off that the customer wants for the cost that it's going to take. Um, once we revisit uh, the simulations and, and revisit our targets, uh, the next step would be refinement. So again, we'd go to ideally take a functional prototype vehicle to a full-scale wind tunnel and really go through and map the vehicle. Um, if we still have those active aerodynamic devices, map those as well in, in all the various operating conditions and make sure that we have that so that we can use that to confirm that the vehicle is gonna operate as we want on the road, but also help inform any of the algorithms for the different control systems on the vehicle that they're gonna need to make sure it's optimum. Um, once we do all that testing, uh, you know, then the last step again would be validation where you take a functional vehicle onto a proving ground or you know, closed circuit track, run the instrumentation, confirm that the range and the cooling targets that you started out with, you achieve or hopefully exceed. Um, so really, you know, it's different, um, but it's really the same process. Um, and it's really all about being objective in your decision making and making sure that um, you, know, you, you are improving the performance of the entire vehicle and not just focusing on the aerodynamic characteristics. Absolutely, I think it's such an important point that the targets may be different, but the core development cycle is the same. All the processes for quickly developing CFD concepts and CAD surfaces, wind tunnel parts, the pit stop changes within the wind tunnel and the data reduction tools at the wind tunnel, all of that is applied the same. Even if the targets are different, um, our, our process is very continuous. We adapt the goal, the process to fit the goals of the customer. So that's why that target setting, like we said at the very beginning, why that target setting phase is so important because that's where we're understanding what the goals are, understanding those key trade-offs at the very beginning of the program. That way the entire rest of the cycle can be adapted around those targets. <clears throat> I think it's also important to note that this process is born in motorsports. Therefore, we apply a motorsports uh, a motorsports mindset and motorsports motivation towards this vehicle. Whatever the target is, our team is extremely motivated to achieve. And while this cycle was born in motorsports, it can be applied to any vehicle that moves through the air. All right, uh, that brings us to the end of our webinar. So now we have time to uh, take some questions. So let's take a look at the chat and see what people are interested in asking us about. All right. Uh, looks like we have a question about off-road trucking. Um, Pratt Miller does have people experience with off-road trucking, but uh, Ben and I ourselves do not um, really have much experience in the aerodynamic requirements for that. Um, we do have some experience testing in scale model with um, a vehicle completely airborne um, and some other kind of similar kind of weird situations like that, 
for safety testing um, with motorsports. So, so there could be some application there, but really we would need to dig more into that particular application and, um, and understand more you know, from, from the customer about what, what the requirements are and uh, how those would fit with the different types of tools. So apologies, don't, don't have a real specific answer on that. We, we need to dig more into that. Looks like the next question was about active aerodynamics. Um, active air obviously creates a lot of performance potential with the vehicle, um, whether that's lap time performance or range performance. It gives you the opportunity to optimize for a variety of different conditions. Um, but the fundamental process for development remains the same for us in terms of using all the tools available between CFD, scale model, and full scale wind tunnel. Um, we would leverage the same processes, the same target setting methods, and ultimately use the same aerodynamic simulations to optimize whatever those vehicle targets are. Looks like there was another question um, on the scale model size that we use. Um, yeah, there's a slide. Let me go back to this slide. And I believe it's one with the truck on it. Um, it's it's very dependent on uh, the vehicle and the tunnel that we're using to test. So um, generally, for our road cars and race cars, that's somewhere around forty to fifty percent. Um, we also have a third scale uh, model for a Class Eight semi truck. Um, again, that's very dependent on the facilities that we're using and the size of the wake of the vehicle. We want to make sure that we're appropriately sizing it to um, accurately represent the flow field without interfering with the uh, wind tunnel test section. Um, and then assuming the tunnel can go larger, it's, it's generally beneficial to try to get a larger size, which, which helps with both force resolution as well as the representation of the physical part. Yeah, Ben, I think uh, there's also often with um, scale model size is the Kind of flow physics and uh, flow equality, um, yeah, Reynolds equivalency, and, and you know those kind of things. So for every application, you have to take those into account and make the best trade-off. There's uh, another question here uh, about CFD correlation. That's a really broad topic, so kind of hard to answer um, in the time we have to really do an entire webinar on that topic, but. Um, just uh, you know, to kind of review that, uh, summarize a little bit. Um, we we really like to look at the flow structures, the flow physics in detail. We feel that that provides uh, the best path to trend accuracy. So as we're making changes, we really want to make sure that we're not being misled and um, you know getting uh, an inaccurate directional response for for the changes that we're making. So Often that can be looking at things like ride height trends or crosswind or yaw trends and seeing how those compare. Um, you know, typically in the wind tunnel, we have a large number of surface static pressure taps that we're looking at. And we look at not just the values of those, but the kind of distribution of those and how the flow structures um, line up with the CFD. And then also, um, Often we're looking at off-body or even specific surveys that we do with our, our, our traverse system to look at you know what what the wakes are doing, what the vortices are doing, um, and compare in that way. The correlation of the actual aerodynamic forces is also complicated by in the wind tunnel. There are many non-aerodynamic aspects that we have to account for. Um, we go to great length in trying to. Uh, minimize those as much as possible and certainly understand the magnitude of those and the uncertainty. Um, but, you know, that's something that, that we have to really look at in detail to make sure that we're not including or confounding um, our aerodynamic results with mechanical uh, forces or non-aerodynamic forces. So it's, it's really kind of a combination of those. And we do find that sometimes to get the proper flow physics, we might have some remaining offset in our forces. Um, but, you know, again, our kind of philosophy is that we're really trying to get those flow structures accurate 
try to duplicate that so that as we're making changes, um, we have confidence that the changes are going to follow what's really happening uh, on road or on track. And um, you know that that's that's really the, the core of what we're looking at. And, and also really understanding why you know why is this happening because if we just kind of fudge the numbers to match whether that's the you know the flow structures that we're seeing or um, or the forces, if we don't know why, then we can't really use that in the future to um, to improve our process and, and make it less likely that we'll have correlation issues. Yeah, and I think in, in our experience, that's something you have to watch for is in CFD, you have so many different tuning knobs to potentially get the body forces to line up with what you've generated from the wind tunnel. And maybe you can adjust those tuning knobs in a way that gives you correlation in one specific vehicle state for one specific vehicle design. But as soon as you change the ride height or as soon as you change the geometry of the vehicle, um, those same settings in CFD may not yield good correlation in another condition that you're simulating. So it's important not to fool yourself into believing that you have good vehicle good correlation just at one state. And I agree completely with Ben's point that the goal here is to represent the flow field so we can understand what's really happening and then use that to develop the vehicle design um, to whatever the program targets, whatever the program targets are. All right, we have a, another question. Um, Question about uh, part deformation. Um, I think that's certainly a, a very interesting aerodynamic, something we have experience with um, in a variety of the programs that we've worked on. Certainly, you can um, run FEA to understand the expected deformation and then use that to represent the shapes um, in the deformed state in CFD and scale model wind tunnel. And then, obviously, one of the uh, benefits of full-scale testing is you have the actual vehicle parts uh, that have realistic deformations during your testing. Um, obviously, you need to be conscious of the uh, vehicle test speed and things like that, but um, we have several different ways to represent that, and I think that's a big part of tuning the vehicle for realistic on-track or on-road conditions. There's a, a question about what CFD software we use. So we, we, you know, that's again, you know, kind of a broad topic in terms of the different methods for, for CFD solution. Uh, we, we leverage a few generally, uh, you know, unsteady RANs and hybrid turbulence methods. Um, but it really, again, kind of goes back to defining the program targets and what the priorities are. And then you know, tuning that, I guess, to, to make sure that the, the tools and the methods used are appropriate and match for uh, the throughput and the accuracy that, that are really important. There's a question about unsprung aerodynamics and someone's asking us to help finish the design so maybe we can take that offline if you want to follow up with ben and i will be providing our uh, contact information there so um but yeah i mean certainly we, we do look at unsprung arrow um, as, as an important factor often for certain applications yes the next question is about the c8r early development um obviously with the long history of corvette racing we have the um, convenience of being able to start with a known baseline from the previous generation car in terms of the vehicle targets. So, um, you know, starting with the C7R aero maps before any part was drawn, before a single CFD run was kicked off, we were able to artificially manipulate the aero maps and understand sensitivities to, you know, the top level aerodynamic targets as well as some of the secondary targets when it comes to the vehicle attitude and ride height trends. Um, and that sort of set the, the targets of what we wanted to achieve once we got into the uh, detail of the wind tunnel development. But of course, um, at, at, like you say, at that point, the um, it was already known that the C8 road car would be mid-engine. And therefore, of course, the, the race car uh, follows that due to the homologation regulations. 
Um, and there were many differences and I'd say a lot of advantages uh, to switching to that layout. Um, just the overall efficiency of the vehicle and as you get into the regulations of what parts can and cannot change, there was some inherent efficiency with the new shape. Um, things like a uh, longer floor with a larger underwing allowed us more ability to make efficient front underbody uh, downforce. Um, the shape in general, uh, initially with um, similar aero enablers as a C7R, uh, was more efficient in terms of drag versus downforce. Um, but then, you know, of course, as we get into the development, all the surfaces on the car end up changing and we iterate away from what we did on C7 and, and evolve it into uh, what the new car is. So I think that's where it's important. You can't just, you know, copy paste what you've done before. And that's that's why that target setting phase is so crucial. Um, you need to understand what those targets are and then you you follow the results that you find through development to achieve those targets. All right. Um, I think I think that's all the questions we have. Thank you yeah. so much for your time. Yeah. Thank thank you everyone for joining. Um, apologies again for the streaming issues that several attendees reported. Um, just so everyone knows, we will be sending out a link to the video um, in the email addresses that were registered as part of signing up for the webinar. Um, please reach out with any additional questions directly to Ben and I, and we'll be happy to set up more detailed discussions in the future. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.